So good afternoon. My name is Susanna and this is my friend and helper Freya Rose. And today we want to show and tell you how a woolly jumper is knitted from the sheep's fleece to the finished knitted jumper. And we would like to show you our handwork skills and share a little bit about traditional textile crafts as well. Okay, and then I'll be showing you about wool spinning first and natural dyeing. And then Freya Rose will come in and show you how to make your own knitting needles and a little bit about knitting, isn't it? And then we'll be looking at knitwear and clothing in the end. So that's okay, isn't it? So I'll see you in a minute. You can sit down again. Right. So if you want to make your jumper from scratch, because that's what we're talking about, how people would have worked long ago in Ireland and how they made their clothes, so you need to get your own sheep's fleece first. And in my case here, I brought two sheep's fleeces with me to show you. I have a dark brown one, and you can see it here. It's called a, a Zwarbel's fleece. So it's a lovely dark fleece and very suitable for wool spinning because it has long staple lengths. And that means that when it's been knitted, the, the knitwear isn't going to be scratchy. So we're looking at that when we try to get a suitable fleece for wool spinning. So when I get my fleece, I have, that's the Swarbel's fleece. My other fleece I have with me today, another kind of unusual one to look at. And I have them squashed in here now, but this is called a Jacob's fleece. So from a Jacob's sheep. And also another unusual type of breed and also very suitable for wool spinning. So what we need to do is when we get our fleece, we have to prepare it first. So when you get your sheep's fleece straight from the sheep, we need to clear off the dirty parts and just discard them. They're not suitable for wool spinning. And the most suitable parts on, from the sheep's fleece would be the back and the neck because they're very clean. So I'm going to take a little bit of this sheep's fleece here. And then the first thing I do is, without even washing it, all I do is I take some of my clean bits of wool. So can you see it's all knotted up? There are still bits of straw and things there, but that doesn't bother me now. But what I like is that the fleece is quite oily and the oil in the fleece is called lanolin. Do you want some wool? You can have a little bit and you can smell it and feel it. Here, you can share that. So the lanolin in the oil is keeping the moisture out and keeps the fleece <laughs> to a certain extent. Well, it does it smell nice? Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> I'm getting my fleece. I like the smell of sheep. And here is my little bit of sheep's fleece. So what needs to be done is we have to prepare this wool to straighten all the fibers and get them ready so that we can spin them into thread. And the way to do it, the old fashioned way or the traditional way would have been to use these carding brushes. So they're special brushes with spiky parts inside and they're a little bit curved like that. And we use those brushes to straighten the wool and to make all these lumps on the wool, to make them all straight and run in one, in one direction. So that's the first thing we have to do. If you want to do some wool spinning at home and you don't have access to carding brushes, that's okay. You could just use metal combs or like pet grooming brushes or combs that are really suitable just to try it out. But what you need to do is you load your carding brush on one side and put your fleece on. And then with the other brush, you just brush it straight. So you're straightening the fibers. And that's what, what I'm trying to do here now. And it's really not my favorite part because it's very tedious, but it's been done. So can you see already now the lumps are gone? It's, that's what we want. We want the fibers to run straight. And then you just take these parts off and roll them a bit. And then you have to make sure that this is to tidy away. You roll it up and you have a, la a tiny little bit brushed. And that's the way to cut the wool. So you need to cut an awful lot of wool ready to spin first. For me, that's way too slow. I'm not going to spend hours cutting wool like that. So. I invested in a drum carder. So what I do is here, I just move that now. This is a really great tool. 
tool. So you can come up and see. See, this, this tool is called a drum. Can you still see it? Yeah. No, come on up. <laughs> it's okay. So this is so so handy, this drum card, because I can do the same, very same thing again. I need to straighten the hairs of the wool, the fibers. But this time I can put my load my drum card here on the side. And when I turn the handle, it just gets stretched over. And you just have to turn it. Okay, you can see the, the bits of dirt that are just flying out. That's handy too, isn't it? So turn the handle and all the knots should be brushed out now. Now, and then what do we do? We cut it off. So we cut, take the scissors and cut the cross. And what we need to do now is lift it off so it doesn't break. So it's just one whole piece of nice straight wool. So carding the wool needs to be done to get all the knots out. So we, got, we can get a nice straight thread at the end. Okay, and I was saying, we tried to make the jumper from scratch. Um, and you can see now the problem was when people long ago wanted to make their own clothes and they knew that wool was a really suitable material to wear because it's warm and it's soft and it's uh, to an extent waterproof but the problem was like it's not strong enough like that isn't it so if you wear it it just falls apart and then the question was but how do we make this these fibers stronger so that they would last longer, so that we could wear them, uh, you know, for a long time without them falling apart. And then thousands of years ago, people figured out that they could make those fibers stronger by twisting them into thread. So and that's what we're going to show next. So we have to make thread out of the wool, isn't it? So we can knit. And that was like a difficult thing for people to figure out a long time ago because they didn't have access to all sorts of tools. The most basic tool they used was this drop spindle and it's a really good invention really because what it is it's like a spindle like a wooden stick right that's pointed at the front and then they put a weight at the bottom of the stick like a round weight what could it be wood isn't it make a hole in the middle and stick it there and push it tight. Or what else could they have used for a weight? They could have used a piece of clay, couldn't they? Or even if you want to do it at home today and you haven't got a drop spindle, you could put a small apple at the bottom of the stick, couldn't you? A little, or a small potato. Just this piece of weight at the bottom of the stick um, created this tool and it's called a drop spindle. And this is what it does, so that they figured out that if you held it there and it twisted it and it started to spin for a prolonged time, that the thread started to get twisted at the top, doesn't it? And it made the wool, the fibers strong. So we'll be try that out now. So I take a bit of this wool and what I have to do is you overlap it there. So what we want is that this thread that's already made gets tangled up with this at the start, right? And then you twist it a bit and it should turn into thread. And this was the way women have been spinning wool for thousands and thousands of years. And the need, you know, to make cloth and clothing was really great. And it was always the job of the women in the home while they were looking after the children in the cooking pot to make some thread as they went along. So this was like a daily occurrence. Making thread was just part of their life. So I'm trying to make a long length easy. And the spindle should reach the ground in a minute without breaking. Um, <coughs> then there you go. Can you see? So I have a length made. And then I have to stop spinning thread up here. Because now what I have to do is I have to now wind the thread that I made 
onto the stick to store it. So like that. And then I spin a little bit more. And on and on it goes. And the trick to do wool spinning by hand like that is not to squeeze the wool too much, just to hold it loose. Because the fibers need to just run loosely. If you hold it tight, then the fibers can't get pulled down and made into thread. So the drop spindle was an essential tool to make thread and it's been used for thousands and thousands of years to make thread and it was a very time consuming, very tedious way to make, make thread and was done all over the world. Um, then in around the 12th, 13th century, the spinning wheel appeared in Europe and the spinning wheel was just a really great invention, wasn't it? Because what does it mean when people have the spinning wheel? Can I just move this? Right. No. Can you see it? So this spinning wheel I brought too. This one is called a Saxony wheel. And it's a, a model that is like you can say it's set up from the bottom up. So you can see that the pedal is at the bottom. Can you see that there's a pedal? Mm -hmm. So basically, the, the spinning wheel now made things go much faster. And not everyone obviously straight away got the spinning wheel. It took a very, very long time for the spinning wheel to spread around all the countries. And drop spinning with a drop spindle was still very popular until the 18th century. I'm, I'm at two more down. So, when, when people then acquired the spinning wheel in the house, what, what, that, what did it mean? It meant that they could make more wool than they needed. And then it meant that they would have an extra welcome income. And it meant that they um, also, like that it, the economy prospered when there was more wool and more trade. So it was a, a really great thing to have in the house. And for that reason, because it was such a prized and precious tool to have in the house. People didn't just make it any way. It, they tried to decorate it a bit to show it off because it was a valued item in the house. And even the tradespeople who made those spinning wheels, they showed off their skills making those spinning wheels. So you can see that the wood is nicely carved. It's made from oak wood. And not only that, they decorated the wheel. Can you see that it's been painted? Okay. Now, not any any sort of way, but exactly the, in that way that the, where it was com, came from, from the north of Holland, it was like the style of their traditional furniture paintings, so the, the Hindelopen style. So they decorated all their furniture in that style of painting. And what, what happens here is on the spinning wheel, <coughs> basically we don't have to stop spinning to wind the thread by hand again so that it makes it that's what the spinning wheel is kind of the wool winding device it makes it go really fast so what i have are these bobbins can you see them and that's where the thread is wound on and i have one there sitting on the wheel already and some spare ones here and some really fancy little wooden screws that just look they're just wooden screws but they just done so nicely to show everything off and then at the back at the top i have this leather belt again with a large screw and that's my tension so i can tighten it and it can go really slow or i can have it loose and it just would go off really quick but i want to have my thread nice and tight you know so we have to have a tension belt so this goes here at the back right and then here at the front and I'm going to spin a bit of wool. I can show you, I'll show you this way, right? Is that okay? Yep. Okay, so I have to get a chair. And what do I need? I get my wool. And, okay, my carpet wool, that's still the same though. That still remains, that they had to cut the wool first. And now I'm sitting here and get my foot on the pedal okay. and then 
do the same thing again. But they can do it so much faster. So. And can you see now? Now my foot is doing something, my two hands are just stretching the fibers. Can you see that there? So I'm stretching on them. And see what happens is they get twisted really quickly and then pulled in and wound around the bobbin. And the, the aim is to just get the thread nice and even. And you have to make sure it doesn't break, don't we? Because we've been in the right mess then because we wouldn't find the start up there again. So like that. And you just keep going. And once you get the knack, because it's not that hard, it's just a lot of work. You just be doing this for hours and hours and hours. Really? That, and you have no other choice. People just had to do it, didn't they? It, and why did they have to do it? it? Because the need for clothes was just so great. And not only that, there was another problem. That every weaver who was weaving the cloth afterwards needed five wool spinners to supply him. That meant the weaving was happening quite fast, but the wool spinning was that slow that the weaver could go take five wool spinners wool to make one cloth and the wool spinners were just continuously always really busy because it's the slowest part of the of the textile craft is making the thread so to make a jumper an adult jumper and you're doing this wool spinning it would take at least 40 hours of wool spinning just that alone and nothing else just to make this thread so so people had these type of wool spinning wheels, but I brought another spinning wheel with me that I want to show you. Because now, in the 18th century, things changed a little bit in Ireland. Because before that, Ireland was quite famous for their wool trade and their wool cloth. And their quality of wool was highly prized all over Europe, even it's to such an extent that Italian the north of Italy, they bought Irish wool instead of their own. And do you know why that was? It's because the sheep had a better diet in Ireland. They always had green grass to eat all year round. And then their, the fibers, the protein fibers were much better, better quality than say from an Italian sheep or one from Spain. So they started buying cloth and wool from, <coughs> from Ireland and then refined it much more in their own countries. And Ireland became quite famous for their wool and their quality of wool. But that, was, that all changed in the 19th century when these kind of laws were manipulated. And, and their wool trade was kind of priced out of the country. And they had no other choice but to then spin flax into linen. So flax is a plant, you know, that grows like a bit like a cereal yeah but that was then what had to happen and what happened then was that these spinning wheels were introduced to Ireland and these are flax spinning wheels originally from Holland and they kind of established themselves in the north of Ireland because that's where all the flax and linen industry was especially in Belfast but especially also in the north of Ireland and this spinning wheel is a traditional flax spinning wheel that was built by a family in Donegal called the Shields family. And there's still a, a third generation spinning wheel maker there who still makes those spinning wheels. So it's a flax spinning wheel. And we can see that it, the setup is a little bit different, isn't it? It's got the wheel at the top and the pedal is there. And we have a long way down from the pedal up to the wheel, which means I have, I have a, a bit more work to do with my foot. And also that the bobbins, these little things that store the thread are they're way smaller than there. And why is that? Because the flax thread is just really thin. We didn't need massive bobbins, didn't we? So this, this is a beautiful example of a flax spinning wheel and it's made from ash wood in, from, in Cardona in County Donegal. So I'll just show you how this works now. My wool. So of course I can still spin wool on this. And then just get it going again and hope that it works. And then you just push. See, now I have to pedal a little bit more. But the, the, 
the bobbin is flying around much faster and what I can do here now is my thread can be spun really thin thinner than on the other wheel and I can make beautiful thin thread on this spinning wheel if that's what I want but it's just more work again isn't it yeah and we still haven't made a jumper we still just only spinning wool which is not nothing really because you can spin your wool and have all the wool in the world but we still have to make a jump right so I'm gonna stop now and put my wheel around away so this can go there can't it no and when I have my wool spun I'm still not finished would you believe it I couldn't just take it off the bobbin. See, my wool is here. Can you still see that there? Right. right. Now I have to bind my wool on this reel to make it all to hold it together. So I'm going to bind it. See, like this. And usually I do it from the other side. You're binding your wool onto the reel and you tie it in four sections when it's all wound and then you take it off and then this is what you have then. And you have a skein of wool, see like this? And then what you can do then is you can wash your wool then. That's, that's when I wash my wool. I haven't washed it before. It's still smelling until then because I like the grease in my hand when I spin it. So you can wash your wool and if you had to buy cheap your wool look, would look a little bit like this. And if I had a brown and white sheep, the J cups, my thread looks like that. Nice color, isn't it? That, that's nice enough, isn't it, for a jump? It wouldn't be grand. Or if I had my twardless sheep, please, I'd have a lovely dark and still a few little bits of color in it, isn't it? But do you think that's good enough to make a jump like that, isn't it? But, but it, it just wasn't, wasn't it? For, we always need to show off a little bit. So wearing brown jumpers, everyone, we, 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 it wouldn't be good enough, wouldn't it, Freya Rose? No. So what did people do? They wanted to make their wool and their clothes colorful because we always needed to show a little bit who we are and where we come from and, who, you know, who to stand in our life. So people started dyeing their wool. So how can they do that? They, they couldn't just go to the shop, Freya Ross. What would you do now if you needed to buy some wool and there's nothing? You get the plants and you can and different ones will die. Okay, we'll look at this out. So look at this, because people were quite smart, weren't they, all the time? So they dyed their wool with different plants that were plentiful. Oh yeah, it's fine. <laughs> you can I just keep going. So <laughs> So they made their dyes from plants. Sorry, sorry about that. You're fine. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And so they had different choices. So the you. kind of, you're welcome. Want to keep it? Yeah. So the dye, you can stay here as long as you want, or you can keep it or leave it here. Okay. So the dyes that people used were kind of the local grown plants that were plentiful around their house. Thank you. But you're welcome. So some of them I'm going to show you now here is one of one very popular one would have been just to make green. And to make the green, they either used ferns or colts foot. Got, that just gr grows wild everywhere. And what you do is, how do we make a dye? You just pick a lot of the, of the plants and you boil them in a pot. And then it's, it's like making a soup, you strain it take the plants out once they've been boiled for an hour and then you put your wool inside and it gets boiled, carefully boiled because you don't want to ruin your wool, it could be totally destroyed um, and just let the dye absorb and the main aim is when you make a natural dye is that the wool is there permanent so that it doesn't wash off in the rain or fade in the sunlight and you just use, sometimes you use different types of mordants like little minerals to make the wool stick or the dye stick to the wool and that would have helped to also create brighter colors so people had little tricks so they might have used copper pots to, to brighten up the green color 
or they used to soak rusty nails in water, and then that that um, iron water made the wool darker. So, in case of green, to make green, you could use a little bit of copper, and then you straight away get a lighter green. And to make a dye from nettles, for example, then it's the same process again. You get your nettles, you boil the nettles, and you soak your fibers in it and you can create different shades again depending on what type of mordant you use afterwards to soak your nettles. You can make it a little bit darker with the iron bath or you can put a copper solution, the blue stone helps, copper sulfate or just the copper pot and make a different shade and made from the same nettles. Okay, so we have nettles and we have cold food or you could make a yellow, a really gentle yellow, nothing too to write home about really just from God's flowers that grow abundantly in this all year round almost. You pick your gods, you you put, put the flowers in a pot, your wool, and then you have a nice kind of creamy yellow. Um, and the last one, of, okay, as well, is making a dye from tree barks. So the tree bark here that's been used was black thorn. And the same again, you saw, you get the tree, you're not going to cut the tree down just for the dye. You, there'll probably be sticks lying around and you peel off the bark and soak the bark and then boil that bark and then dye your wool in black tone. So these are kind of the traditional Irish dyes that people could have made at home. It depending on where they lived as well, but they were kind of the abundant plants. Not every plant is suitable, but just some of them to show you. Now, I'm gonna, it's here, we've got good to be. So the other dyes that people commercially dyed, say in medieval times, were much, much brighter, of course, than what we could do at home. And of course, that's what the aim was, to get the most brightest, stunning looking colors, so that we could show off a little bit more. Now the three main colors, that the dyers had, the commercial dyers, were red and yellow and blue. And that's all they needed because they're three primary colors, aren't they? And what can you do if you have red, yellow and blue? You can mix them, can't you, to make different colors? So that's all they needed. So to make green, they just mixed the green, the, the yellow and the blue, or to make an orange, you could mix these. So different ways to mix and create more colors. But these three main colors were like what they used. And the, to make the red, they used mother. And the mother is a plant that's just grown for the purpose of dyeing. So it wasn't like a plant that grew in the wild. It was, it's a crop plant grown to make dye. Um, and I'll show you have it here in a little jar. No. This one. So mother is a, you take the root of the plant and you dry it then, and then it was soaked and boiled up again, and your wool gets boiled in there on the cloth, and you get a beautiful bright red, and that's what they really wanted to achieve, to make these bright colors that lasted, that were permanent and reliable, okay, and substantive would be another word. So red was definitely one of them made from mother. And the next color, easy to make again, was the same again to use welt resida it's a, another type of a crop plant specially grown to make yellow uh, really easy to dye at home you boil your your dried welt up it grows easy it probably grows in most european countries and it produces a beautiful bright yellow so these two were quite easy to make, but it was a different story to make the blue, because you couldn't just take a blue plant and think you're gonna get blue, so that wasn't the case. So to make blue, we have two different ways of making, two different plants of making blue. One would, would have been woad, that was very popular in medieval Europe, and then that was kind of, the indigo came in because indigo was already used all over the rest of the world. Most of the time in India, where it originated from, 
and in um, Japan and Asia. But let's talk about Wald first. So Wald was the blue that people had for centuries in Europe. And it was reliable, it was nice and blue. They achieved the, the, the dye, but it was just not as, as a strong as a, an indigo. But yet the world trade was flourished greatly in Europe for, for the early medieval times, especially in France, where it grew, and um, in the south of Germany, and, and in Italy. So world is a plant especially grown for blue again, and you get the green leaves. And the same with indigo, it's a plant grown to, to make blue. You also get the green leaves and people knew for centuries, for thousands of years, that the bacterial dye from both or indigo would make blue. And to both of them to make the blue was you soaked those leaves or you rotted the leaves in urine. And then that you, the urine then that liquid released the dye that was green in the in the kind of in the container and you put your fibers your white wool in that and it was green when in the container but the minute you took it out into air the wool changed from green to blue and that it was like a little tricky to do it's just a simple explanation but th this was the most reliable color that there was available then was this indigo blue and when the kind of the trade routes opened up in the 15th century indigo replaced wood in europe because it was much more um reliable and blue would have been like used a lot even in flags so you know countries that were political before dyes became artificial you, they all, almost always have the same colors, don't? So they always might have blue in the flag and red as well and white. And that's because the colors were so reliable. So they used all these. And, okay, and then I have a range of colors here at the back and I'm not gonna tell you all about them. But another one then was, that I would want to talk about is that they would, lo would have loved more exotic dyes eventually. And when people went far and wide, all over the world, uh, uh, then came back with this most unusual dye made from insects. Did you know that? Well, so forget about those plants. Couldn't show, that they, they don't look great. Don't imagine now having a dye made from ladybirds. But they're not ladybirds that we have in Ireland, so they're kind of called cochineal ladybirds, and they're from South America. And they were especially bred to make this beautiful dark red. And then it was ground into a powder, and when it's ground into a powder, it just looks amazing, like that. But the process is the same, you soak your wool, you boil it, like no obstacles were left and turned to make a dye. Like anything was tried, just to have the loudest, brightest colors, and you know, to show off your, your wealth and your clothing in some shape or form. Right, so we talked about the dyes, and I'm now Freya Rose, it's, it's your turn now to show how to make knitting needles, okay? So you're gonna be sitting here and I'm gonna move all this. And Freya Rose is gonna show you because she has great handwork skills and we want to show you how to make your own knitting needles. That'd be great, wouldn't it? And I'm gonna let you do this here. Okay, you can come up. And I'll get you out of the beat. So what do we need? You can start talking to us. Hmm? You have to say it. What do we need? So to make your own you need all the needles. What do they look like? I hold them up. So what do we need to make needles? We need olive oil. We need an oily rag. We need the glue, sandpaper, paintbrush and these kind of sticks. So, first, Susanna, pencil strap them. Oh, matching that one. You forgot the beads, didn't I? Oh, yeah, the beads. Yeah. You get your stick and you sharpen each end of the pencil strap. Talk loud. Come on. Just show you how to make needles. Then you do the other side. 
the other end. So, yeah, this is going to run out of cost. Why do we have to make to sharpen the needles? Why? Why do we have to, to, to why do we can't we leave them the way they are? Because we need to be able to lift the stitches up, isn't it? Yeah. So you sharpen your needles and then both ends. Have you got them? And then you're sanding in. Why do we do that? Because it makes it nice and smooth. Yeah, so you're sanding the stitches. Already, so we're standing, keep talking. We're standing, we need these for that, like they're nice and smooth. And I'm going to sharpen the ends of these ones. But how many needles do we need? Two. Yeah, look at the And there you have your own stuff. No. <coughs> right. I'm just tidy up a little bit. Keep going. You're still okay there. Right. We have come as far as the dyed wool and we still haven't made our jumper. And now we, I'm going to talk a little bit about knitwear and textiles. And the first thing I'm going to show you is that once we have all these different pads, bits of wool, what, what we could do now is make patterns when we're knitting with it. And that was like the most important part that we could show off our clothing, clothing patterns. And when I want to knit the jumper, like this, in this case, uh, that I would follow a strict pattern and, and I can do so when I start knitting from the bottom up and each row would, would change over to, to create a pattern now with our two um, different colors. And then the wrong side would look like this, that the changes are happening all the time. So this would be one way of knitting, making patterns and showing off these colors again. And another way then, this knitting pattern spread all over Europe, would have been different countries. Our islands even had their own style of making patterns, even so that we would recognize 
different regions and their patterns as well on their clothes. And one other one would have been like the fair isle knitting, so that they had patterns that repeated themselves like in stripes all the way down and they've changed quite a lot. But again, that we use different colors and different patterns to create like an effect on the clothing. And this, the same here, have some more now at the back. Making patterns. So, so one more show, to show another pattern would be to change and even the texture and patterns then will create a, a different look. So, and then obviously then instead of patterns, this is like more my favorite part, is to make textures with the wool. And Ireland was quite famous for that with their iron wool jumpers. And traditionally, the iron wool jumpers from the west of Ireland, where the wool that was used was undyed natural wool, it could have been grey or white, isn't it, or brown. And they also left the, the oil, the lanolin in the wool, because what, the, what they wanted to do is to make those jumpers waterproof to an extent, so that the fishermen could wear them while they were working. Um, and then also, traditionally, these iron jumpers had four to six different textured patterns on the jumper that kind of repeated themselves. So we'd have like a moss stitch or a cable knit like that. And there each one, each different pattern was about two to four inches wide. And they ran up from as a column from the bottom up. And then they repeated themselves across the jumper and the sleeves. And then we also know that many households, they are the women who were knitting those jumpers, they kind of had their special favorite patterns that they used. So not every single iron jumper looks exactly the same. And that was also a good thing, because then people could recognize each other by wearing the jumper. So they knew who, whose household people belong to by the, the look on the pattern as well. And these iron jumpers were very popular for a long, long time in Ireland. And the women who knitted them did it for an extra bit of income, you know, they, it was handy for them to knit, while it was still popular to wear heavy woolen jumpers. But that's kind of for forgotten now. That's not the case anymore with central heating and all that. We don't need to wear those heavy jumpers anymore. But still all the same, it's nice to have a nice example of a hand-knitted iron wool jumper like this. And so the textures can also show off a little bit in, on a jumper. I want to show you another one. So this texture is kind of a, it's a net type of texture. And then we have lace knitting at the bottom and around the neck. And just really now the difference of weight is, is very significant. This jumper weighs probably about 300 grams. It's very light because it's got wool and silk and very, very easy to wear compared to an iron knit jumper which is a heavy thing to wear and almost unbearable to wear if it's like too hot. So the, the wool has changed and the wool knitting has changed so much that it became more fashionable now and that the, the wool isn't like just sheep's wool. It, it's, there's always a little mix in it to make it lighter and more easy to wear. So we have textured knitting, we have pattern knitting, and what else have we got high rows? Lastly, just to, to show you what else we can have, we could have dress knitting, isn't it? And the same thing again, it's all ha by, done by hand. And then in the dress knitting is the same. We, we have textures, and to show off a little bit here, the kind of the style is that um, you use you use circular needles and you go from the top down all the way and this in this example it's just this is my, made in one whole piece the body part so there's no seams on the sides that's just one piece and then the sleeves were inserted so that that, that took a long time to make but also to, to show the texture in this case 
here we have another where the textures are added and again that you knit it from the top down but usually when you make jumps you knit from the bottom up and to avoid having to make seams right okay and then what else have we got left we have jumpers and dresses we need to talk about socks Okay, I'm back. So one more thing before we finish. Um, I said I promised my neighbor. To, because it, it's important that we know how to knit socks. So it's no good talking about all these fancy things you can wear and the scarves. But I suppose the, ma the most thing that's, that gets worn out are the socks, isn't it, that we're wearing. And therefore, it's a very good thing to learn how to knit making socks because you you get so much techniques out of learning to knit the sock from the from the ankle to the heel and then making the toe and it was such a valued skill to knit socks that a lot of women especially in world war one and world war two were knitting for the army and to you know to supply the soldiers with socks and kind of also them to, uh, have this u unity then you know that they know that they did something good for the country by knitting army socks like that and in Feldgrau and then they went as far I just wanted to show you that people even made these knitting magazines to knit army socks and everything had to be exactly as the pattern described you know followed so that you could make need things to for the army and um, supply an army with socks but most of them socks were needed by women at home you know to help the greater good of the country so knitting socks would be a really valued skill to learn and even now Frey Rose you can will you come up for a minute with the knitting because we're going to finish off now and Frey Rose is a really good knitter right come on up and we just want to show you that now when children learn knitting in school, it's such a valued skill that when, when let, me see, let me show you what you need here. So Freya Rose learned to knit by making a gnome. And now she didn't just make this little gnome. Now we started when we were in second class and there were a lot of techniques here that children can learn by just knitting themselves a simple toy, isn't it? But it was a lot of work. And what else do we need? Yeah. Patience, isn't it? But the, all sorts of knitting techniques are here on the, on the gnome to just learn, learn all these little skills that you can then establish yourselves with. So that, then you can just show them one last time how to do a knit stitch and a purl. And you can say the verse. So you can sit here again on the chair. Here. So you can say how to knit. How do we knit? Come and talk now. So we're doing in this stitch up. And what's in through the front door. Run around the back. No, what am I doing? No, 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 no. In through the front door, run around the back, peep through the window and off jumps Jack. In through the front door, run around the back. Peep through the window off the jack. This is a pearl stitch. In through the back door, run around the gate. Is it? Yeah. Peep through the window off jumps gate. In through the back door, run around the gate, peep through the window, off goes gate. Do one, do two more. In through the back door, run around the gate, peep through the window, and off goes gate. In through the front door, run around the gate. Ah, peep through the window and after. Good. Well done. Can stand up for a minute. Now, 
we finished our little talk about from the fleece to the finished jumper and we hope that you enjoyed it and thanks for Athlone Castle for having us today and thanks to the Heritage Council and the Irish Walt Town Networks for hosting this event and many thanks to Freya Rose for coming with me today. We didn't even practice this. this and well done to you, Freyros. Thank you for coming. And slong foil until next time. <laughs>